Thank you for joining us this evening for this special climate, heat, and illness presentation, a collaboration between the Miami-Dade Climate and Heat Health Task Force, Florida Clinicians for Climate Action, and Baptist Health South Florida. My name is Jane Gilbert. I am the Chief Heat Officer for Miami-Dade County. The first speaker is Dr. Cheryl Holder, who is a physician board certified in internal medicine, an associate professor of medicine and an interim dean of diversity, equity, and inclusion at the Wertheim College of Medicine at Florida International University. I got into this whole world of climate and you have our objectives, which you've received before, and no conflict of interest, and I take my first slide and I always start my presentations with Ms. Anna May because this is how I started connecting the dots. Um, she came in with all her medical problems, the usual diabetes, high blood pressure, COPD, and had been decompensating at home and used up all her, her refills. And she needed new refills, all her medication for her breathing medicines. But what she got me at the end was right when at the end ready to leave and docs know this, she gives me a form and asking me to sign to see if I could help her cover her light bill because she had fallen behind. And it was then that I started really realizing there's more to this. And I started hearing more about the hot days and the hot nights. And these are the things that were affecting Miss Anime and so many of my other patients. I started learning more. And before I get into greenhouse effect, I want to talk, do a quick poll just to see where we are. Um, the first poll is here, and you can see it, the number one weather-related cause of death in the U.S. And these are the different things that we hear about, flooding, wildfires, hurricane, heat, extreme cold weather. Choose an answer, and we'll see how much we have some understanding. Okay, the second poll question. According to the Gallup poll, who is the most trusted profession in of ones that we have here? Is it the doctor? Is it the nurse? Is it the high school teacher? Is it the pharmacist? Who is the most trusted professional here? All right, so let's get started. So what I started learning was about the greenhouse effect and about all that was going up into our atmosphere that was blocking our sun rays that come down from going back out and creating like a little blanket around our world. And it's in that blocking of the heat from going back out and being absorbed in our planet that was causing the rise. So with the greenhouse effect, a lot of pollution and a lot of particles were going into this, into our atmosphere. And over time, we knew this all started from back when in the Industrial Revolution. And we know the Industrial Revolution goes back hundreds of years, but it really didn't start picking up till in the 50s to 60s that we saw this significant increase. The planet itself will always exude some of these gases, but is it with the increase in using of fossil fuels over the last 50 to 100 years that we know man has had a tremendous role in increasing the amount of CO2 in our planet. And so what we've seen is that too much CO2 is being trapped in our atmosphere, which is increasing our heat. And as the heat comes, it gets trapped and it primarily gets trapped in our ocean. 93% of the excess heat is trapped in our oceans. And that's when we see where we are, especially in South Florida, with the intensity of our storms, the hurricanes that were usually two, three, fours in take several days now are rapidly increasing from a level two up to level five within days. And that's because so much heat has been trapped in our oceans. And over the last year, as you can see from this, we've had a significant rise in our summer temperatures. And this is what we've experienced with the global mean temperature going up from the 1800s to 2025. We see a tremendous increase and we're hoping that we will be able to avoid the worst of all. Right now, we've seen over a 1.5 degree increase. And with that, we've already seen the fiercer storms, the rise in the sea level, 
right now Miami is into our king tide season where the water is coming up from our ground level and coming into our streets. We're having more animal and plant extinction. We're expecting more disappearing corals, more people are dying. And this is from all our greenhouse gases. Now, where is it coming from? We know transportation. We see our cars, they're all run by fossil fuel, generating electricity, a lot of coal burning, a lot of oil and gas, industry itself, commercial residential use, agriculture. That's all leading to an increase in our greenhouse gases. Our US health sector is also very big and you know as doctors and nurses, we have a lot of single use. Our electricity goes all day. We use a tremendous amount of power to keep our US health sector top in the world. But with that, we're emitting the fifth in the world amount of greenhouse gases. We are responsible for 4.4% of the global greenhouse gas emissions and almost 10% of the US gas emissions just from our health sector. So we have evolved into this thin line where it's just we must maintain not too much particles in our atmosphere that we are increasing the risk of melting all our glacial ice, melting and sea level rise and desertification and vector diseases and everything else that we talk about. It can't be too hot and it can't be too old for our life on earth to survive. And with the changes that we've seen, we have tremendous health impacts. And today is just a little bit, we're gonna start with heat, but as our series continue, we're going to go through all the different things that we see our warming climate has happened. And this you see, we use heat wave where we have an increase in heat illness, worsening of our heart and lung disease, asthma, traumatic injuries. Think about after a hurricane, everybody's out there trying to fix and cut the trees, tremendous amount of traumatic injuries water and foodborne illnesses, allergies. We've had dengue fever, we've had Zika, we've had chikungunya, we've had all these different vector-borne diseases. We have, and also a lot of stress, the emotional stress that we see in coping with this. And primarily killer heat, and that's what we're gonna have to deal with. And we know over the next hundred, um, the next few years, we're gonna have more and more of our days that are over hundred degrees. We have all the environmental factors. And you'll learn more about this as we go through with pregnancies, with asthma, with the, especially the vulnerable populations, our trees growing faster. So we have more allergens in the air. The increase in heat worsens the ozone levels. Again, we talked about vector-borne diseases that are rising throughout the, the as you go up in the latitude, with the, Zika, the air pollution that's linked to every disease there is, the algae bloom. We've seen neuro neurotoxins that's coming from the algae bloom, flooding, migration, so many factors that will be impacted by heat. And but that's where we know that as health professionals, and here's the answer, nurses, number one health professionals. If we as physicians and nurses and pharmacists can work together, we can really work and help our populations, our communities, especially the most vulnerable, prepare for this. But we have to have a better understanding of what the health impacts are, what we can do, what are solutions, and our role. And we can see that through acting with 22 million health sector workers in this country, just starting there, we can have a tremendous impact. So we have to act on climate, we have the tools, we have the knowledge, we just have to do all the learning. And tonight we start with heat. Thank you. And now we're next we're gonna hear from Dr. Javon Harrison. Dr. Harrison earned his bachelor degree of medicine, bachelor of surgery from the University of West Indies. I'll quickly be presenting on the pathophysiology of non-exertional heat related injury, mainly focusing on heat stress or heat stroke. So the body, how does the body manage heat? So the body manages heat through an intricate process where heat is produced and heat is lost. The main mechanism by which the body gains heat is through absorption through the environment. And this is significant, uh, especially in the Miami-Dade area where as Dr. Holder referred to previously, the number of hot days are increasing 
So the absorption from the environment is going to play a more significant role than it previously did. Of course, the basal metabolism of the cells, as well as muscular activity, and activity of hormones do play more minor roles, but the main mechanism by which heat is gained is through the environment. Heat loss is mainly through evaporation, and this becomes significant when we discuss sweat a little later on in the presentation. So if you remember from basic physics where water, which is a major component in plasma, has a specific latent heat of activation where it traps heat and this heat that is contracted from the environment is sent to the skin where sweat is produced and this water through evaporation dissipates this heat back to the environment. This is the main mechanism by which our body tends to deal with removing heat. Now quickly, I won't spend too long on this slide, but the thermal receptors in the skin sense heat, se uh, sends the signals to the pre-optic area of the anterior hypothalamus and through sympathetic neurons in the thoracolumbar chain, it sends signals to create the pseudomotor response. Now in the pseudomotor response, these are mainly cholinergic in activity and via the M3 receptors, this is where the M3 receptors stimulate the eccrine sweat glands through a G protein coupled receptor and through phospholipase C and protein C, not to get too deep in it. We have increases in calcium, which then trigger sweat production. So here we can see a nice diagram showing the sympathetic response here. And the main point I want to get across with this slide is that when chloride is being secreted into the lumen to be transported to the skin, sodium follows paracellularly. And of course, water likes to follow sodium. So we can see where heat through being trapped from in the water is transported along the duct all the way to the skin. And interestingly, sodium and chloride is reabsorbed at the level of the ductile cell, closer to the skin. However, water does not follow suit and we tend to lose water as we produce more sweat. So at the cellular level, this can be deleterious in the sense where, so we're producing sweat, heat, of course, is going to cause some amount of stress to the cells. Oxidative phosphorylation, which is where we create most of our energy, becomes uncoupled, as well as there's an increase in inflammatory markers that becomes produced when cellular stress is induced from all of this heat, right? So, when there's increase in the oxygen consumption and the oxidative phosphorylation becomes uncoupled, we tend to have more anaerobic respiration. Now, remember blood is being shunted from the central organs all the way to the skin to try and get rid of this heat. So when this happens, it leaves these organs to undergo more stress from not being perfused properly. So, of course, in the liver, we can see an increase in liver transaminases from damage to the liver cells from not being perfused. Of course, the kidney will be affected. The kidneys are not getting any blood. So there's an increase in the bone and creatinine as well. Death to the muscle cells can occur. And in some cases, there have been, it has been shown that rhabdomyolysis does occur. And of course, there's hypoglycemia from the ineffective respiratory processes that's happening. The inflammatory markers, uh, um, cytokines and other mediators are also increased and these inflammatory markers 
end up causing a wide array of symptoms. And to note, coming up um, in my reading, I've noticed that a lot of literature points towards disseminated intravascular coagulation occurring as an end result of all of this inflammation that occurs. But of course, the main organs affected because of the hypoperfusion would be the hepatocytes, the vascular endothelium, and the neural tissue. So who is at risk from this excess heat that's being awarded to us from the environment? The very young, of course, and the very old. Why children? I've separated the causes or I've separated the reasons why they're at risk into things from the environment and physiologic differences in these individuals. So from the environment, sometimes children lack supervision. They don't go and get replenishment of their fluids as quickly as they should. And of note, in more recent studies, obesity is being um, heralded as a main inciting factor in why children are affected. We know that the incidence of childhood obesity is increasing, unfortunately, and this extra fat causes extra insulation, which worsens the heat that these individuals do feel. Physiologically, children produce less sweat than adults. They have a larger surface area to mass ratio, which allows them to actually contract more heat from the environment. They have smaller blood volumes. So imagine the blood cannot shunt from these vital organs to the skin to dissipate the heat back to the environment. And these are just some of the ways. There's more, but I'm strapped for time, so I'll move along. The elderly. The elderly is a population that we will definitely see being affected by the heat. Physiologically, they have loss of their red pigments, red pegs, sorry, and pretty much the skin is not perfused as efficiently as when they were younger. So their dissipation of heat back toward the environment is not as effective as it should be. We know that a lot of these elderly individuals do have chronic illnesses and they do have calcification of their vessels. So they have tonic vasoconstriction that does affect effective delivery of blood back to the skin, decreased sweat production, just to name a few. And of course their comorbidities, which ties in back towards the physiological aspect does affect it. Of note, I want to highlight polypharmacy as there are several drugs that do contribute to excessive heat stress on the elderly. And this slide shows a nice depiction of the different drugs and the levels that they do act. Of note, I'd like to make note of anti drugs with anticholinergic side effects. So these can include tricyclic antidepressants, a lot of people on that, um, cholinergic receptor antagonists. Um, and of course, not listed here on the slide is diuretics. Diuretics play a major role. So those heart failure patients, they do get affected as their blood volume is effectively lower than that in the normal individual. So heat related illness and what to do. So quickly, this is mainly for the home setting, what to do in the setting of the home. So this is more for what do you do when it happens at home or on the road? So heat stroke, which is where the body temperature of 103 degrees Fahrenheit or higher in an environment where heat cannot be dissipated effectively. And this definition also must combine central nervous system dysfunction. So these patients usually will complain of headache, dizziness, if they're able to communicate this to you. What do we do here? Call 911, remove them to a cooler area of node. We, don't, we should not really give these people fluids to drink. 
The reason being, it, when we move them to a cooler area, it causes some amount of vasoconstriction peripherally. This vasoconstriction sends blood back to the heart and it reverses the hypoperfusion of the vital organs that we are concerned about. Heat exhaustion, again, another variant of heat-related illness, is where you have heavy sweating, patients complain of muscle cramps, tiredness, and they usually have a weak pulse. Again, we move them to a cool environment, remove their clothes, place, give them a sip of water in this case, and place them in a cool environment, right? So just to wrap up, other variants do include malaria, which is sunburn, which is heat rash, sorry. Um, people do have sunburn as well. And in these patients, the recommendation for people to prevent sunburn is that you should apply your SPF 30, some sources say SPF 50 or more, apply it to the skin every two hours. Some sources say even as much as every 30 minutes to prevent this. Um, and especially in the Miami-Dade County where there's a lot of beaches and a lot of outdoor activities, this is of course significant. So I just wanted to highlight a few. There's more information, but as I said, for time, I think this is what I'd like to bring across to you guys about the pathophysiology and how to manage heat-related illness in the home. Thank you. I have uh, no conflicts of interest. So I'm gonna talk to you briefly this evening a little bit more about specifically what we're experiencing here in Miami-Dade County and specifically the populations here that are more at risk to, um, as a result of some studies that we've done here locally. As Dr. Holder mentioned, heat is the leading weather-related killer actually globally, but also in the United States. And certain populations are either more exposed to heat, such as outdoor workers, people who are unsheltered or have a hard time affording their AC or their AC breaks and they can't afford to replace it. People who have to walk and um, spend a lot of time outdoors, whether they're athletes or kids playing outside or elderly walking and staying at a bus stop. Those are more exposed. And, and as you just learned from Dr. Harrison, there are people who are more sensitive, whether it's children, elderly people on certain medications. Um, and so those are, those are your, your patients we need to be particularly, we're all at risk, but we need to be particularly mindful of them. Um, and, and, and the good news is that most heat related illnesses and deaths are preventable. So really that's why we're here tonight. We do have an increase in heat as, as um, Dr. Holder shared, shared uh, the increases globally in Miami, our average minimum temperature has increased about a little over two degrees Fahrenheit since the 1970s. And we have 77 more days with a temperature over 90 degrees since the 1970s. And looking forward, we're gonna see dramatic increases, particularly in those dangerously high heat index days. So heat index is being is a combination of temperature and humidity, which is a critical uh, indice here in Miami with such high humidity. A day just with a temperature of 90 degrees can easily be having a heat index over 100, which is uh, does present dangerous conditions for all of us. Um, and we're going to see dramatic increases in those number of days with a, with a uh, heat indexes of 100 and 105 going forward. Um, we're not only getting increasing heat here because of climate change, but our development patterns are creating urban heat islands. We can have a difference of 15 to 20 degrees uh, from our rural areas, from the Everglades, et cetera, than out in, in our urban areas where we've lost tree canopy, we have less vegetation, we have more impervious surfaces, um, and we have waste heat from our buildings and our vehicles. So all of this is creating urban heat islands and they're varying degrees. 
Tree canopy is one of the biggest indicators of an urban heat island. Less tree canopy, it's hotter. And it is dramatically correlated with household median income. In other words, on the left, you're seeing census blocks in the white that are lowest average household incomes and or median incomes. And on the right, is the whites are our lowest, less than 10%, which is very low tree canopies. You can see how much they are correlated. This is absolutely an issue of equity. Um, as I mentioned, we did a vulnerability analysis and looked at the areas, the zip codes with the highest number of heat related uh, emergency department visits and hospitalizations. And then also looked at what were the geographic and demographic correlating factors that might be um, at, at play in these areas. You can see the area of Deep South Dade, Florida City, Homestead being one of the most at risk areas. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about those statistics in a bit. But also in our uh, central and, and west North Dade areas, also very high risk areas. So some of the biggest correlations, strongest correlations are uh, people living in poverty, the percent of people living in poverty, uh, people living in mobile homes or substandard housing, uh, in terms of emergency department visits, people living in areas with high daytime surface air temperatures. Those are those highest urban heat islands, areas with a high number of outdoor workers and families with children. Those are our most, seem to be our most vulnerable. The other research we did was to look at what were the excess heat deaths during our hottest days in the summer. And um, because heat related deaths are, are grossly underreported uh, otherwise. So this gave us a better picture of how many heat attributed deaths we have. And there, there, there were about an average of 34 a year in the five years pre COVID. And we see an, one more death per day with a, a, a 10 degree increase in heat index. The majority of those deaths, what we have as a challenge here in Miami-Dade County is not these episodic heat waves like we see in many parts of the rest of the country, but our chronic high heat. Most of our heat related deaths are happening below our high heat threshold advisory levels of 108 and 113. So it's important that, you know, as a mayor, our, our mayor declared May 1st through October 31st, an official heat season to, educate and inform people that during this whole time, we're actually reaching uh, temperatures that anyone could be at risk, particularly those that aren't used to the heat, but also those that are highly exposed. Um, and with that, I'm gonna, oh, and I meant to tell you more about um, that, that deep homestead, Florida city area. So just for a sense, 30% of the workers there are outdoor workers. That's much higher than our average. Our average is what about 5%, 5 to 8%. And we have over 30% of the population there with that are living at or below the poverty rate. And well over 30% are families with children. So they're, they, they definitely have more of the risk factors there if you're serving clients in that area or in the central west um, Miami-Dade area, it's important to keep heat in mind in your questions to them. And we're gonna focus on solutions and sharing valuable tools and resources for you to continue your learning and enhance your ability to educate and serve your clients. Mr. Dr. Sack is a board certified in the areas of internal medicine and gastroenterology. He serves as a volunteer physician at We Care at Borland Groover in Jacksonville, Florida. I'm wrap up today, sort of cleaning up uh, for everyone. And if I find, if you find some of my presentation a little repetitive, that's true because we're trying to emphasize certain key points. I my focus is to summarize some of the points been raised by other 
speakers and to offer you resources and tools as health professionals that you can use in your practice and share with your patients. I uh, have no actual potential conflict of interests in regards to this presentation. I'm, I'm going to talk about three things in these in the last couple of minutes. Uh, who is at risk? What to teach your patients? Uh, tools for protecting your community and resources to share. And I want to answer Dr. Hol one of Dr. Holder's uh, quiz questions from the very beginning uh, when she asks you, uh, what is the number one cause of weather-related and climate-related death? And it, and it is heat illness, which is the number one cause of weather-related and climate-related death. Several of the speakers have talked about who's at risk, and this is terribly important as patients come into your office or you're seeing them in another setting to immediately think, should I consider heat illness for this patient? Of course, the very young and the very old we've mentioned already. Uh, these are other risk factors. Some of these uh, Ms. Gilbert recommended. You think about uh, out, people who work outside, um, at carnivals, uh, telephone linemen, uh, agricultural workers and other workers, people with physical disabilities who may be more vulnerable because they can't get out of their home during a heat emergency and may need attention. Athletes, remarkably, who go out and do extremely strenuous work and exercise outside, uh, but not prepared for it, not with adequate rest or adequate um, fluids to compensate for their fluid loss. Tourists are a major a risk factor that people come from the north where they don't expect our hot climate. Uh, they're outdoors having fun and suddenly they collapse from heat illness. Remember the unhoused, the homeless uh, in your neighborhood. Uh, draw attention to them. Uh, be sure they get the help that they need. And finally, the mentally disabled who may not be listening to the news, may not be aware of a heat emergency, uh, may not know to seek help, uh, and also maybe on medications that Mr. Harrison explained to us, put them at higher risk for vulnerability to heat. So think of these other at-risk groups in your neighborhood, around you, uh, and, and be sure they're getting the help they need. Okay, what to teach your patients. First step is planning ahead. Now, a lot of these seem very obvious, but uh, ideas to share with your patients, that they should have fans ready at home ahead of time, especially if they don't have air conditioning. They need to keep the air conditioners fit by having them inspected annually and changing the filters according to the manufacturer's recommendations, which is generally every three months. Know what emergency shelter your family will go to on a hot day if the air conditioning fails or the electricity fails. And in your community, it could be that there are designated shelters already prepared that have backup generators, or maybe to have people be aware of the low, the nearest um, uh, library, for example, that may be a cool place they can go. Patients need to know what medicines and documents to take with them if they must leave their home in a heat emergency, and to remember always to plan for their pets. And finally, to ask your patients to know their neighbors. Be aware of who may be elderly, frail, disabled, mental impaired, or unhoused uh, and need help in an emergency, to be stewards of our neighbors. Okay, what to teach patients to do when that very hot day, that heat emergency arrives. Of course, to take precautions if the temperature might be 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 degrees centigrade, or warmer at lower temperatures because when the humidity is high, as Dr. Holder explained, the uh, heat index can be quite high and one can be in danger even below 90 degrees Fahrenheit if the temperatures are high. During the heat emergency, stay indoors, close the curtains to keep your home cool, and stay cool with showers and wet towels. Use fans to help increase evaporation, perspiration, but Usually it's recommended to turn off the fans if the temperature is more than 95 degrees inside because the fans can actually make conditions worse indoors. Wear loose, cl loose clothing and of course a hat if you must go outside. Drink plenty of water. Doesn't have to be any fancy expensive drink. Uh, water's fine. Seek a cooling shelter, a mall, a library, a movie theater, a local cooling center if your home becomes intolerably high to check on neighbors who may need help. And of course, one should call 911 if they experience significant weakness, dizziness, shortness of breath, or chest pain. Remember, heat stress increases 
the physio physiological requirements for cardiac function. And so if someone has impaired cardiac function, they may not have the cardiac reserve to tolerate a very hot day leading to cardiac symptoms like shortness of breath or chest pain. <clears throat> okay, what should you teach patients about things they should not do on hot days? They should, of course, obviously, avoid strenuous exercise outside on hot days. Don't barbecue that contributes to air pollution. Uh, have Don't have open fires or use non-essential machinery or appliances on hot days. Remember, your local utility company is already stressed by the increased demand for electricity to fulfill the air conditioning needs of the community. You don't want to add to that with uh, using other non-essential machinery in your home or, for example, even charging an electric car on a very hot day, increasing demand for the electricity grid. Don't drink alcoholic beverages because they interfere with our thermal regulation on a hot day. And never leave children or pets or the elderly inside a vehicle, even for a minute and even on a cool day, frankly. All right, I'm almost finished here. Uh, protecting your community. And these are really points of advocacy. We as health professionals have a greater than common voice when we speak to our elected leaders and our public health officials. So urge them to plant trees, to create parks and other green spaces that are cooler and places that people can go to enjoy the natural environment. Our community should have a media campaign each spring on television, radio, and social media to remind our residents of heat's dangers in advance of the most severe heat of summer. Create self-air-conditioned shelters where people can go on very hot days. Have a plan, have a plan to contact and transport our high-risk residents on hot days. Our community should write new building codes to insist on white roofs that tend to keep our buildings cool, energy efficient buildings that are less expensive for us to live in and more comfortable to live in. S encourage the use of solar panels on our homes and apartment houses and commercial spaces and to encourage the installation of electrical ve electric vehicle charging stations so people can travel comfortably and not require burning of fossil fuels to such a great extent driving gas powered vehicles. And finally, there should be a telephone hotline and text where people can call for advice on very hot days so they can get emergency help or know where to go, where to find their shelters. Okay, some resources for you. These are four useful websites you might jot down and keep in mind for more detailed information. There are also websites you can share with patients. Uh, the Miami-Dade County uh, has an extremely good website called Extreme Heat uh, with lots of resources and ideas, and it's getting better all, all the time. Our physician, Florida Physicians for Climate Action, FCCA, has lots of useful topics, uh, both on heat and other issues. My Green Doctor is available in two languages, mygreendoctor.org, and migraineoutdoor.es for our Spanish preferring health professionals and patients with lots of uh, waiting room brochures, posters, and other resources with information that can be downloaded and put in the office or that patients can simply read on the website. And there's a wonderful service from the website called AmeriCares uh, that has, climate, has resources for de helping develop the climate resilient, resilient health clinic. So these are four great resources, Miami-Dade, FCCA, migraindoctor.org, and from AmeriCares. Uh, these examples, some of the brochures that are available from Migraine Doctor, uh, available in English and in Spanish for your patients to read online. So you don't have to be a, yourself a climate health expert, but you can send your patients to these resources where they can read them in the comfort of their home on their, uh, on their phone or on their laptop or desktop computer. <clears throat> Okay, we talked about who's at risk for heat illness, what to teach your patients, advocacy tips for protecting your community, and online resources you can share with your patients. Remember, heat illness is the number one cause of weather-related deaths and the number one cause of climate change deaths. Have this always in your differential diagnosis, particularly in the summer when you see patients, and help protect your patients. Thank you so much, Dr. Sack. I'm Patrice Tyson. I'm a nurse practitioner, and I'm also a member of the steering committee for Florida Clinicians for Climate Action, and I will serve as your moderator for the Q&A session. Our first question is for Dr. Harrison. Uh, in the slide from the CDC guidance on heat stroke, 
there was mention to not offer anything to drink. So the question is, what would occur if we were to offer fluids to someone experiencing heat stroke? A study that I um, came upon where um, patients at, in Saudi Arabia who went to Mecca experienced heat-related illness. Um, it was shown that most of these patients actually have a normal, so even though they're losing fluids, they actually have a normal central venous pressure. It was over 80% of the patients. So their recommendation was not to give more than one liter of fluid, whether orally or IV, um, since cooling the patient shunts blood, causes peripheral vasoconstriction and shunts blood back towards these vital organs, such as the heart and the lungs. So they said that they recommended not giving more than a liter of fluid if you do, because you do run the risk of causing an acute respiratory distress syndrome or even circulatory overload in patients at risk of these conditions when you do give, when you aggressively try to hydrate these patients. I hope that answers the question. This next question is for Dr. Holder. During your presentation, you mentioned that emotional stress is one of the health impacts of climate change. What have you been seeing in the area of mental health in regards to the heat effects, uh, the health effects of climate change? Well, um, some of the data that's coming up now, we're seeing increased anger, increased emotional responses, um, learning changing. They've done studies where they had children, the young people, college kids, in the non-air condition in a regular hall, and their recall and learning was different compared to those who are in AC. Um, we've seen time and time again, increased violence, and they've done data in the Northeast a lot and increase in violence. Now they're always confounding variables because it's usually in the summer, but generally on hotter days, they see more violent activities. Uh, we know also that we see another thing called eco-anxiety, which is increasing in younger people as they fear the problems around climate change. So just the heat itself creating the problems of physiologic change, increase impulses, more anger, more changes in those regards, and then the triggering of the concerns around climate and learning difficulties. So we're getting more and more data around the mental health effects. Now, after the extreme weather events, which we is linked to climate, the things I talk about you'll see is depression, um, increased suicides. So there's more and more that we're finding out about the mental health impact. Uh, in, we're going to have another session just on mental health and heat. So today's session is just a, a tip of the iceberg to show you how many areas are impacted. And we're gonna have one entire hour on mental health and heat. So stay tuned. The next question is for Dr. Sack. We know that time in regards to being able to educate our patients is an ongoing barrier a lot of times. What are some clear and concise messages that you would recommend to share to be able to educate our patients in our routine encounters? Thank you. Well, you're sure right. We don't have a lot of time in the office and even to take a minute out is awfully difficult. A couple of answers. Quick answer is we don't know yet. There's research being done to find out how health professionals best should communicate climate and health information with our patients. So stand by over the next couple of years, we'll learn more. I'll give you two examples though. Uh, one is uh, there's a physician in Minnesota who's created a 45 second script that he uh, tells every patient to make them aware of this topic. That's one thing you might consider. Just write a short uh, sentence out that would be something like, um, climate change is a big problem. I, I want you to be thinking about how heat and storms and other problems might affect your health and try to get prepared for it. So that some simple sentence like that might be helpful as part of your a physical exam or your history, particularly if you see a have a patient who's is heat vulnerable. And finally, to consider giving your patients some resources, maybe a short flyer that your office makes available in the waiting room with links to some of these organizations like the Miami 
Mammy Dade website or uh, Migraine Doctors Resources or FCCA. So consider putting a flyer there. Uh, you'll find online many resources like that. For example, uh, some of them just have simple QR code. You can say, hey, here's a QR code you can go to and come to many resources. So there's information out there. Uh, just a little bit of time spent could make a big difference in saving a life. Can I come in right here? We uh, Part of our grant funding from the Miami heat season is to come into doctor's offices. And you'll see we're creating a whole team that will bring some literature um, with QR codes and help the staff be part of the team. We're recommending that it doesn't just stay with the physician, that you your MA, your your all the different levels that are in the offices, the nurses, the medical assistant, the patient care tech, everyone can be part of the messaging around heat, especially during heat season and recognizing the vulnerable. And we hope to bring some of the literature to the community, to the different offices. Um, so again, you'll get with our, whoever is on, you'll get an email with some of the information and inviting us in to help prepare the team. We encourage you to bring this to the team. So the docs are not burdened with the whole thing, but it's part of your differential in your coding. You can recognize that heat plays a role in some of your decompensation and code appropriately. Thank you, Dr. Holder. This next question is, are there any legal protections for outside workers in Florida from the health from the heat effects on health? If not, are there any legal protections in other states for vulnerable outside workers that Florida could learn from and emulate? I'll take this question. Thank you for that question. It's a critical question. So uh, the short answer is no, there are not. Um, the OSHA, our Federal Occupational Safety and Health Administration, just last year committed through our Biden administration, committed to coming up with guidance on heat, but that will take some time. That could take a decade before it becomes official. There are guidance documents. Um, states that have are, are uh, Oregon and California, and um, there are others that are looking at it. We did work with a group of community-based organizations and uh, the two, two leaders from Miami-Dade County to try to get a heat standard set for the state of Florida this last session last year. And unfortunately, that did not go through. So we're now looking at, for the first time, a local government looking at, could we create uh, heat protective standards and requirements here at a county level. We're still in the um, analysis phase of that, but that is definitely an important question. And uh, we, we, we are, are looking to see what we can do here locally. Let me add a, another point is that every employer who has workers outdoors needs to become aware of this issue. Uh, most yeah industries now are creating standards or guidelines or help for big employers. And there are even apps available that an employer can use to be aware of where a, a worker may be outdoors, how long they've been outdoors, even how long has it been since they took a break. So ask your employer if you are in a vulnerable situation to, to provide the information you need to keep you safe. Next question. Is there literature that I can order to share with the customers who come to my pharmacy? Yeah, we'll see. Um, the last slide that Dr. Sachs had was just a list of um, really good resources. Also, floridaclinicians.org has a list of resources um, that will take you with list of medications and more information. And heat.gov has information. The website, the Miami-Dade County has websites. And if you have your email, we'll also send you information after this, this session where you'll have this information so you can get more. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of our speakers for this wonderful education and for all that attended this evening. Good evening, everyone.